Good morning, everybody. It's been a great conference to date, hasn't it? Two full days of just uh, you know, looking at opportunities to be able to advance our knowledge, expand our networks, and to grow our pragmatic acumen. It's just been a wonderful, wonderful two days. We got another full day uh, today yet. Um, pleasure to be with all of you here today. And, um, and know that I share with you the experiences of being able to collaborate with a network here amongst us to be able to look at the value of our synergies and to be immersed in an important exchange as we've all been talking about. In the field of cybersecurity as a field and practice, but also most importantly, looking at how we manage our risk on the home front. Very, very important. So with no further ado, uh, I wanna, it's my pleasure uh, distinct pleasure and honor to introduce our speaker today, uh, Director Vicki Machetti, the Director of the Defense Industrial Base Cybersecurity Program Office uh, and under the DOD Chief Information Officer. She joined the Office of Secretary of Defense in January of 2011. Ms. Machetti has experience in working with industry and over 28 years of federal service. It includes 22 years as a commissioned Air Force officer, and prior to her current position, she worked as an information systems engineer and as a program analyst. Ms. Machetti has also a distinguished military career and retired from the United States Air Force in 2007. She earned a bachelor's degree in mathematics from California State University, Sacramento, and a master's degree in atmospheric science from Creighton University. Please welcome me introducing our keynote today, Director Vicki Machetti. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for happy, having me here and inviting me on behalf of the DOD CIO. We're really pleased to be able to talk to this group a little bit today about cybersecurity and DOD's interactions with the private sector and a lot of the things that DOD is doing to promote cybersecurity. Uh, so with that, we'll get started. Uh, th this morning, um, the first presentation obviously talked a lot about cybersecurity and the threats out there. And just here's a few fun facts uh, to let you know that this threat is very, very real and very per pervasive throughout the defense industrial base. Um, cyber threats are targeting, obviously, our environments. U.S. is the most targeted country in the past three years. That's a pretty significant statement um, that, that all of this activity really is focused on the U.S. And why do you think some of that is? We have great innovation. We have brilliant uh, people in this country that are doing great research and development and developing these capabilities. And uh, those are capabilities that are really sought off, off at by, uh, from our adversaries. So with that in mind, if you think about what the defense industrial base does for the department, uh, you build our capabilities. You build our war fighting capabilities. You help us in everything that we do. And the defense industrial base is so important to maintain the integrity of the information. And it's a huge challenge, as we've talked about this morning. Um, the the um, adversary attacking and stealing our information uh, is costly. It's cleanup from an incident response can cost you a significant amount of money, whether it is just either building, rebuilding your um, your reputation, rebuilding the information that has been lost and compromised, and also in some cases rebuilding the infrastructure that has been compromised. Uh, it is a significant investment. So with that in mind, I want to also point out that about 61% of our breach victims are businesses with less than 1,000 employees. The focus is on small business. Its focus is on those who are less capable or less resourced to be able to um, defend themselves. And that's a huge problem. Um, we also know that throughout our supply chain, as we're looking from the department down, that uh, industry, the large companies that have a lot of resources are not the first line to be attacked by our adversaries. The adversaries are working their way down the supply chain and really um, looking for that weakest link. And you're only as strong as your weakest link. So we have some challenges ahead of us. So with that, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, more about the threats. Uh, the U.S. is engaged in this competition against our adversaries. Our, our adversaries, as mentioned earlier in the briefing, was Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea. They're definitely targeting us. We have a lot for them to take. And what do our adversaries do? They come in and they want to steal our data, 
in order to counter our capabilities from the DOD perspective, to clone those capabilities, sometimes bringing those to market faster than we can and undermining our business and our economy, or to uh, counter those capabilities and to be able to make our war fighting capabilities ineffective in the, in the domain. So with that, they are using these tools to undermine all of our capabilities, whether it's economic, um, de defense, or otherwise. And stealing our intellectual property is a huge problem. So what is the US doing? Well, one of the things that we did is identify this in the national cyber strategy. Um, there were four pillars identified by our administration. And if you focus on the first one, defend the homeland um, by protecting network systems, functions, and data. Uh, so this is where I want to really to take a deeper dive and where the US government working with private industry is important to have that partnership. Ms. Hess talked about that this morning, the partnership between the FBI and industry and the private sector. Well, DOD is also feel strongly that we have to have those, pri those partnerships in place as well. Um, and federal contractors are providing important services and capabilities to all of the, the entire country, but most specifically we're focusing on the defense piece of that, and we do that as we look into the defense cyber strategy. The cyber strategy was released in 2018, and it represents our focus um, against working against um, adversaries who are looking to erode our capabilities, but also to how we are going to defend our own intellectual, our own um, capabilities, as well as collaborating with our industry partners. Um, so this is our cyber landscape chart. This kind of gives you the idea of how we're trying to prioritize our efforts within the department. It's kind of a pretty big busy chart, um, but you can see here this is where we're focusing our priorities. We look at our own in underlying infrastructure, our own network and information sharing processes, how we work through cross domains, how we and have our enablers. And the whole focus here is on ensuring that the warfighter has the capabilities that they need to prosecute in any type of environment and challenge. If you think back, today is the 75th anniversary of D-Day. If you look back at what we were doing at that time and the capabilities that we had from a warfighting perspective and how we have evolved so tremendously in, those, in the years since then. The, uh, with the advance of the internet, with computer technologies and capabilities, there isn't a warfighting platform today that doesn't have some sort of computer or computer capability in it. And where there's a computer or a, 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 a you know, a motherboard or a chip or anything, there's always that possibility for compromise. So what our really focusing on is, is making sure that the weapon systems that are being used and deployed by our, our warfighters, our military men and women, are safe and, and able to, to do the mission that they are out to do. We don't want to find out at, when you're flying over, you know, the South China Sea that all of a sudden that our, our weapon system is not effective. That is not the place to have that discussion. So we want to make sure that our warfighter has the tools that they need. It requires all of these things in the landscape. And then the bottom line there, you've got the human factors piece if you talk about the insider threat, um, as mentioned earlier, but also our supply chain and our partnership, and our partnership with critical infrastructure. So this is a great picture that we use to kind of lay out how we're addressing our priorities within the department. So what is DOD doing? We have a number of activities in place to work with our defense industrial base to make sure that the information that is developed by and for the department in terms of, and the capabilities, is delivered in an uncompromised way. There is a report out by MITRE that used those terms, and, and it really is true. We want to make sure that our information is protected and our capabilities and the, the um, innovation that you and industry are able to to develop is actually protected when it's delivered to the department. So we have a number of activities that we're doing um, to ensure that happens, starting out with securing our own information systems, and that would be the part that we talked about with that, most of that picture. We also are looking at how we can increase the requirements on industry to tell industry how do we want you to protect our information, and we're doing that through some regulatory practices. We are also leveraging national standards for technology and, um, and for safeguarding, and that is uh, leveraging the NIST um, publications throughout our regulatory practices. And finally, we are um, offering also to have voluntary information sharing through a specific program, which I'll talk a little bit more about. So the Voluntary Dib Cybersecurity Program has been in existence since 2008. 
Today we have over 400 members, um, participants in the program. Much like some of the others that were described by the FBI, um, we have a sharing collaborative environment where we, we push out information, including indicators of compromise, tactics, techniques, and procedures, and mitigation strategies, and we also receive and collect information. Um, the the uh, construct is simply to have a, a signed agreement between us and the industry partner, and then we are, make available a significant amount of cyber threat information. The information is a two-way street. A lot of it comes from industry themselves, and then we anonymize and share it back out with the rest of the partnership. What is unique about this program is the fact that we are fo solely focused on the defense industrial base and the adversaries that are targeting the capabilities that the DIB is, real, is actually developing. So we have a, a slightly different perspective. Our perspective isn't about actually prosecuting someone. Our perspective is to stop the bleeding. We want to make sure that no information gets out. And if, if, if it does, how do we then mitigate that? And so we have a very inter, um, clear perspective on the defense industrial base that um, is, is good for those who are participating in the program. Um, when I mentioned the damage assessment piece of it, there are situations where obviously exfiltration of data does occur. And so what the department is looking at in those situations is what is the impact of that data exfiltration. And it's not a programmatic question. It's not a question of contracting. It's a question of what information was impacted, which would give a vulnerability to a warfighting system or a weapon system, and what can we do to either mitigate that vulnerability or to make it, make it so it's, it just it can't um, that it's non-existent. So either we do a leap ahead in technology, or we change how we're going to implement and use that warfighting capability. So we're looking really closely at those kinds of things to, to make sure that we're doing our best to protect the warfighter. So in our, uh, as we implement this program, and we have been doing this very successfully for a number of years now, our operational implementer of the program is the DOD Cyber Crime Center. So I want to shout out to the DC3. They are one of the national, the federal cyber centers. There are seven cyber centers across the, um, the federal government, and they have a key role in that they are really representing the interests of the defense industrial base as well as their role in DOD. Um, they have bring a significant amount of capability from the forensics laboratory to a training academy um, to several other um, capabilities. But most, most importantly, they focus on the defense industrial base with one section that is really just all they do every day is analytics and um, forensics and capabilities for the defense industrial base. So we find that this, pro this um, capability at DC3 is very well received and um, allows uh, someone to call. So just like if you had the InfraCard program in relationship with the FBI, you could also be calling DC3 and getting some def immediate assistance. So that's a capability and it's a shout out for the, D the capabilities at DC3. So as DC3 sees all the information from all sources, whether it's coming in from the defense industrial base or if it's coming in from other parts of critical infrastructure, they also look at everything that they have available within the intelligence community. And from that, they look at what the trends are in terms of threats and threat actors and what they're looking for. So one of the things that they've done for me is to put together um, the most successful div attack vectors should come as no surprise that phishing is at the top of the list. It is so hard to teach people not to click on the link. It's just the way it is, right? <laughs> but I, I learned yesterday, or, or two days ago, that there's a new tactic. It's, and this is really sneaky, and so you should think about this. Since we all talk about don't click on the link, it's kind of like see something, say something. It's something that you know about and you hear about, so you think about it maybe before you click on the link, maybe. But now there's a new technique. It is to call, to put into the, the email a box. It says click on the box, right? Now who's gonna click on the box? Well, it's a box, right? So I'm not thinking about clicking on the link, and that is the newest thing, a newest way of getting at you. So now it's not only don't click on the link, don't click on the box either, right? <laughs> uh, so, uh, phishing is going to continue to work, and so we want to make sure we're disabling web links, we're looking at those boxes that might be in there. Um, we want to you know, be careful of attachments. Um, to be, those are some of the mitigations that you can take. 
Um, <clears throat> stolen credentials is the next thing on the list because once I can be you, I can be you in your information system and I can go through there and take out anything I want, right? So uh, we really are supportive of the idea of two-factor authentication as a, an, a, a, to authenticate to your network and to ensure that the right people have the right access. Along with that, consider to make sure that you're looking at your role-based access. What is the in, in, in principle of least privilege? If you don't have to have admin privileges, don't give your people admin privileges. There are some places where it's necessary, um, but you should be conscious of that and thoughtful about that and make those decisions with a cybersecurity focus in mind. There's several others on here, but we want to like focus on the last one, the social media. That continues to be a challenge with disinformation, with um, what we put in our public profiles. Um, this has mentioned the um, LinkedIn was compromised. How much information are you putting in those profiles? Are you giving the adversary the opportunity to exploit you and, and to get you to click on that link in the line of crime? It's all, all part of the, the process. So I want to mention a little bit about what the regulatory picture looks like. There is a federal acquisition regulation that will be in all of your contracts if you are doing business with the federal government. And this is the basic safeguarding clause. It, takes, it identifies about 16 basic safeguarding practices that should be on your, you should be using on your networks. And it is in all of these con, um, solicitations and contracts out there, but probably people aren't really reading it and thinking about it. If you're doing business with the Department of Defense, you're probably thinking about something else. But if you're not doing it and you just have other contracts, perhaps with DHS or with the State Department, otherwise, this clause is most likely in your contracts. So just keep it, it's a good idea to read through your contracts, see what's in there, see what's being required. But in this case, there's about 17 best practices that are identified in there. And that should be your really your starting point. If you haven't done those things, Make sure you're doing those things first. In the end, there may be uh, contractual uh, ramifications if you haven't done that. So I'm going to move on to what else the department is doing. So in about 2013, we first issued a DFAR clause, which is a Defense Federal Acquisition Regulation Supplement. It is a contract clause that requires you to safeguard DOD's information as you're developing capabilities for the department. Uh, the original clause had uh, a list of basic controls that we felt were necessary to be implemented. Over time, we found that that wasn't the most successful of a, approach, and uh, we were able to update this clause in about 2016. At that time, we changed the adequate security requirements, and as a minimum, it is necessary to implement the 110 security requirements in this special pub 800-171, a slide on that as well. But the general requirement for this clause, if for those of you who are, many of you may actually be familiar with this because we do a lot of publications, a lot of speaking on this, and has a lot of press, but there's five basic requirements. The first one is to provide adequate security for the information that you're developing on, by or on the behalf of the department. Uh, the second is to report cyber incidents to the Department of Defense within 72 hours. If an incident has occurred that affects the information that you are developing or for the department or that you're holding for the department, you are obligated to report that. And this is a contractual requirement. So you need to keep in mind that you need to have that ability to identify and to report. Um, we ask you, and as part of the contractual requirement, is to submit malware if you're able to isolate it. Now, that's not always a capability that everyone has, but if you have that capability, we want to have it submitted. And again, this is going to go to the DOD Cyber Crime Center where they're going to do some forensic analysis on that malware. Um, the, the good news about that is that when DOC3 gets that information, they're able to look across the board and see what's happening across the defense industrial base. It gives us better understanding of the adversary, the situational awareness, and the cyber threats. It also tells us more about mitigations. And from that malware, we're often able to glean out a lot of more in terms of indicators of compromise that can help you then put it into your network security devices and prevent future attacks. Uh, the fourth part is that damage assessment piece that I talked about, and that is in, um, requiring the contractor to be able to give us an Im at least an image of the network that was affected by an in cyber incident so that we can then do the deep dive in the understanding and analysis of what information has been impacted. 
And the last but not least is the flow down requirement. This one is kind of challenging in some ways, but it says that if you are a prime and you have to flow down information that it requires protection, then you need to flow down the requirements of this clause as well. So that means your subcontractors all the way down the line, wherever that information flows, is, are also accountable to safeguard the information, to report incidents, to submit malware and media images um, as well. So it's important that you have a clear understanding of where your supply chain is and how they're affected. Uh, so this, is, this has been a challenge because there are a lot of um, our small companies are not necessarily um, prepared to implement all of the security requirements. And if you have if this clause gets flowed down to you, there's a lot of question about, well, what do I do and how do I get started? So this basic safe, the safeguarding requirement is to implement the, require, the uh, security requirements in 800-171. This publication was written by NIST and it was focuses on non-federal information systems and organizations. If you look at the body of work of National Institute of Standards and Technologies, most of what they're focused on is things that are for the federal government, um, but the standards are, can be used by anyone, but most of your forcing function to use it is on the federal government. So they had the catalog of controls 800-53, which is about, I don't know, three inches thick, and it represents everything that anyone in the federal government want, might want to implement in terms of um, protecting their information systems. So they looked at that and they identified for the protection of controlled under classified information that the right level of protection would be our moderate baseline. So they took the moderate baseline controls and they revised, rewrote those controls in terms of requirements. So rather than providing specific requirements like you must have a password that is 16 characters long and have this, that, and the other thing, we said that you needed to have capabilities to change your passwords. You need to have passwords. You need to have multi-factor authentication, for example. We didn't tell you how to do it, but we did write them in more of a performance-based pr approach. So they did this in specifically to apply to non-federal information systems. Um, it enables the contractor to use those, those uh, solutions that they currently have in place as long as it's meeting the requirement. So it gives you the flexibility that we don't often have within the department. And it also standardizes the requirements across the federal government. Moving forward, the federal government will be implementing the, require, the same requirements for protection of controlled and classified information. So if you do have contracts with State Department or Commerce or whoever, you will have the same level of requirements um, for all of the protection of controlled and classified information. So it does sound like it's kind of scary when you think about 110 security requirements. How will I do that? How will I afford to implement those requirements? What am I supposed to do to get there? So the first thing I want to say is that not all of the requirements require a material investment. Many of the requirements are about policies or processes. Uh, some of them are about configuration, and some of them require hardware or software investment. So the best thing to do is to look at what your system is, your network architecture, think about what you have in place already, and then identify those things that you have not yet done that would meet, need to be implemented in order to meet the requirements. Now, as I said, I know that that looks a little bit scary, so we have this really cool chart here. The chart lays out the, all the 110 requirements. Um, this is how they're listed, and you can see that we have color-coded it, so you've got policies and processes in yellow, configuration in blue. Software is the orange color, and hardware is the green. And some of them are a combination of things, so you see a little bit of that as well. Um, but the big thing here is to see that there's not a lot of green. There's some yellow, orange, but there's an awful lot of the yellow and the blue. So it's not all about buying stuff. It's not about buying network security devices and things. Um, so let's drill down a little bit. There's a requirement in here for having security awareness training, something everyone should have anyway, um, but it is something that we want to make sure that you have thought through that. There's a requirement to know who's on your network and there's a requirement for multi-factor authentication. So multi-factor authentication tends to be the most difficult of all of the, the requirements. For very, very large companies, they found that this would be very costly to implement because the more number of employees you have, the more number of people you have to issue some kind of token or device to, and that did cost, does cost money. 
Uh, for small companies, though, if you have fewer employees, it may not be as expensive once you get your, your system put into place. And there are a number of solutions out there that meet the requirements. Uh, I'll just tell you, like, my, my personal favorite is, and this is not an endorsement on behalf of the Department of Defense, but the YubiKey that's out there is very, very inexpensive. It's only about $20 a person. So it is doable. Um, if you go to the, the other extreme, the, the PIV cards that are similar to what we use in DOD, those tend to be on the more expensive side of the solution. RSA tokens, somewhere in between. There are many, many solutions out there um, that you can leverage for the multi-factor authentication solution. Um, some of the other requirements that are in here is escorting visitors on your premises so that you know that they're not you know, accessing your computers when you're not paying attention. Another one of the requirements is if you are using a password, and this is a configuration setting, obscure the password. So make the little stars or dashes or dots or something when you type it in. It's a simple, simple setting that can be implemented. So the 800-171 represents a large body of, of requirements that will help you secure your information systems. It is really a good idea to just get started on this. If you don't have contracts yet with DOD, the requirements are there. And if you are going to be managing any type of um, DOD information, it's important to have implemented these requirements. DOD is starting to look. When we implemented this clause in the very beginning, we did not actually intend to go out and check every single company and make sure they were implementing the security requirements. So we just aren't resourced to do that. But we know that a lot of companies are not yet implementing those security requirements, and that is a significant vulnerability. You can be compliant with the DFAR clause by having written a system security plan and having plans of action for when you will implement those requirements, but that doesn't do anything to increase the cybersecurity of your, of your systems. So because of that, there has been a concerted effort in the department to actually start doing assessments and to look for whether or not those um, requirements are being implemented. You may find yourself in that position at some point in the very near future where your program manager is asking to see your system security plan and wants to know if uh, you're implementing all the requirements. You may be visited by other entities in the department. Right now, the Navy is actively assessing some of their contractors. The Air Force is working on a plan as well. We have the Defense Contract Management Agency that has oversight of contracts also looking at system security plans and how those requirements are being implemented. Um, and we have the Defense Security Service that is also trying to get into that, uh, into that uh, process. So we have a lot of entities in the department that are looking to assess. Uh, what we are doing, and this is the good news, is that we are working at the department level to coordinate those activities and have the, an information flow process where we'll be able to share the information within the department so you don't have to be visited by 20 different DOD entities, um, which is sometimes a problem. <laughs> All right, so I wanted to provide to you some resources here, uh, as particularly as small businesses. Uh, it may seem daunting to implement some of these security requirements, and so if you are a small business, you can reach out to the, Nash, the NIST Manufacturing Extension Partnership Program. They have presence in all 50 states, and they have a number of um, cyber experts that can assist you in, in re working th through the requirements that we're asking you to do. Uh, they also developed a handbook, the NIST Handbook 162, which is an amazing walkthrough from the very beginning from like, if you know nothing, you can actually sit down and go through that handbook and really help you implement all of the requirements and figure out how to move that forward. So it's a huge resource. Even if you don't reach out to the NIST MEP teams, at least pull down the, the handbook and you might find it very useful. Uh, the Procurement Technical Assistance Program and the Technical Assistance Centers are also available, and they have presence in all 50, 50 states as well. Um, and they are partially funded by DOD. So their services are usually free to you, and they are also developing expertise. Um, and there are some partnerships, I believe, in this state as well, so that you can reach out to them and, and get some assistance. 
I want to talk a little bit about the security evaluation tool. It was actually developed by DHS. It is a free tool, and what you would do is download the tool, and you would respond to the questions in the tool that talks about what is your system boundaries, where are you, how are you architected, and how are you implementing the security requirements in 800-171. The nice thing about this is it's free, and as long as you have a fairly good understanding of what your network looks like, you should be able to navigate this fairly simply. Um, and the, the output is a workbook type of thing and it help you develop your plans of action for those things that you have not yet implemented. But the other thing that you can do is you can use that as your basis for your system security plan. The system security plan is a requirement in 800-171, so it's something you're gonna have to do. This is a way to, you can um, meet that requirement. Um, just a note on the system security plan, there is no specific format for it, so if you don't want to use this tool, that's okay. Uh, NIST has also published a, a sample of system security plan on their website. You could use that, or you could use whatever it is that works best for you. Um, the department is not directing that in any way. We're just saying you must have one, and it should communicate to us how you're implementing the requirements, and what your system boundaries are, and a few other things besides that. But basically, that's the general idea, so that we can come in and then and say, are you implementing the requirements, and what's missing? Some additional resources out there. Um, we have a, a fairly over 100 frequently asked questions. It's a pretty comprehensive body of work that's published, dodprocurementtoolbox.com, as well as the um, defense pricing and contracting um, website that's the second one listed there. The FAQs are very useful, especially um, the section on implementing the security requirements. Uh, you, there are questions we've received over time about, well, what does this mean, and can you explain the, what multi-factor is or something like that. And so we've been able to capture all of those uh, FAQs and post them available for you. So if you're not sure about something, it's a great place and a resource to go to. I listed up there NIST SP 800-171 Revision 1. That is the current publication, current version of it. Um, the 171 Alpha is our guide to assessing security, the implementation of the requirements. And that is what DOD will be using to determine if the requirement that you have implemented has been met. Um, and it gives us a very structured process to do that. So it's a good one to look at if you want to do that for yourself to see if you're meeting those security requirements. Uh, there's a couple other resources, references up there. I, we put in the distribution statements on technical documents, the DoD I-5230.24, because that is generally um, what gets missed. So when we say information that requires protection, it's controlled on classified information. And we have standards for how we're supposed to mark and identify that information. This is the guidance to DoD on how you do that. So it's sometimes useful to have a familiarity with that publication so you know when you're seeing a document, oh, this one re needs protection. That's really important when you're flowing down those requirements and flowing down that information because if you have information that's marked as requiring protection, then you have to then flow down that clause as well. The last um, I, website listed there is the one for the DIB cybersecurity program. This is the program that I mentioned before that has um, that we offer to clear defense contractors for the sharing of cyber threat information. And so you know, it's easy to apply for the program, you just need to be a cleared contractor and you also need to have a medium assurance certificate to access our portal. Um, we wanna know who's coming in and asking us questions. So I wanted to make sure I left some time for questions, as usually there are a few. Um, but I wanted to summarize here that we know that the adversaries are out there targeting our defense industrial base. It's too easy, too cheap to use malware or other types of attacks to come in and steal the information that you've worked so hard to, to build and develop. So we, wanna, we are really seeking um, better safeguarding, better protection of the information. But we all need to work together. Um, the threat is not going away. It is only getting better and they're going to get better as we get better. Um, so we need to make sure we're working to let, together and collaboratively to protect ourselves against the adversary. Um, sharing information is definitely a big part of that, and we want to continue to keep that flow of information coming. Whether you feel more comfortable talking to the FBI or you want to talk directly to DOD, 
it's okay. We just want to make sure that information gets flowing. Uh, we know that it's not uncommon for something, you know, a suite of capabilities that contractors that develop a certain type of um, ca capabilities are targeted by the same adversary. And, you know, when they hit the first one, the faster we know about that, the more we, likely we are to protect the others. Uh, just because it, you've, you've been attacked doesn't mean you've done anything wrong or you haven't met our security requirements, but we do need to make sure that we have a good understanding of when data is impacted and compromised, what is that impact on our DOD warfighters. So we are seeking a, a, to keep our collaboration strong. Our partnership is with industry, um, and we are looking forward to really stepping up our bar in cybersecurity across the board to protect our nation's interests. And with that, I think I'll open up to questions. Oh, this is our contact information. <laughs> Good morning, ma'am. Thank you for uh, coming and sharing with us. Uh, very informative. Steve Calhoun, Lockheed Martin. I uh, wonder if you could offer some feedback with all the rapid acquisition activity at the service level. Um, for example, the OTAs, right? I mean, certainly mm -hmm. with the Army, the Air Force, there's a lot of movement, and it's all, your, your charts reflect a lot of process and FAR and whatnot. So do you, do you any right. comment there with some of this rapid ac sure. acquisition initiatives? Are they meeting the, the needs that you're laying out? Thank so you. with all the other types of agreements, you're right, the FAR and the DFAR isn't necessarily included and incorporated in there, but we are in the process of updating our DOD internal policies to ensure that if an OTA is put into place or um, that they are also requiring the same safeguarding requirements. So we want to, it may not come out in a DFAR clause, but the language should be present in the OTA that says that you must protect the DOD, infor the information that you are developing for DOD. Uh, hi, good morning. Eric Imsan from UAH. Um, we have a program, <coughs> excuse me, um, a, a grant from the Office of Economic Adjustment. I think I got that name right. I'm sorry if I didn't. Um, helping companies go through this process. And one of the questions that we most commonly get out of small businesses, and I was hoping you could address this a little bit, is they say, well, we think we have CUI, but we're not really certain. And so I was wondering if you could sort of speak to how small businesses can go about determining what is and isn't CUI, if, unless it's just, you know, clearly marked. There's a lot of gray area. I agree, and that's a great question. Thank you. Um, so first and foremost, if there is any doubt in terms of contract or other type of agreement, if you have controlled and classified information, you should have that conversation with the program office, as they are going to be the, the actual experts in that area. But a basic rule of thumb is controlled and classified information is any information that requires some sort of protection under law, regulation, or government-wide policy. So the types of information that are typically seen within the Department of Defense, personally identifiable information, controlled technical information, sometimes financial information, those are the main ones. But the controlled technical information is where we really see the greatest impacts. The, our CTI is things like uh, design documents, drawings, specifications. A lot of the things that you need to develop the capabilities that the DOE is, is um, acquiring. So more than likely, if you have any type of a developmental program, you're going to have some of that information. The only information that's actually excluded from that is pure research, because that tends to be in the public domain. Um, but my recommendation would be um, look for the appropriate markings. It's often the case that it is not appropriately marked, which is a problem that we are challenged with in DOD, but we're working to um, improve our acquisition community's understanding of those requirements. Um, but we really urge that when you have a contract, especially a new contract, that the first art of business should be to sit down and talk through what, is, what requires those protections and how do, I, how do I make sure that that is identified properly. Keep in mind that this, the, our, our DFAR clause is in over a million contracts. It goes in every contract except for those that are solely for the purpose of purchase of a commercial off-the-shelf items. So the chances of having it somewhere in one of your contracts is very, very high, and the chance of you actually having controlled and classified information is also, or you may be developing it, um, is also very high. So you want to start working towards these requirements. Thanks. Next question. Yeah. Good morning. Um, Oh, <laughs> uh, name is Kevin Sileño, um, and anything I say um, only represents myself, not my employer. Um, <laughs> uh, so until recently, I used to work for the largest uh, Navy contractor, um, and the 
well, the largest uh, industrial employer in Virginia. So you may already know who that was. Um, I have a couple of questions. Actually, I have a three questions. Uh, hopefully, you know, you can, you know, um, uh, bear with me here. So um, the chart that you showed with the different classifications of the controls, um, has that chart been updated since 800 171 Rep 1, um, 100 171A um, came out? Because I know that there was, um, that chart came out before the assessment guide was released. So it, we have checked, we have looked through it periodically to validate it, but the assessment guide itself should not have changed the chart itself because the chart is still policy and process. But if you think that there's some disconnect, I'm happy to, to re-engage on that. Okay. Um, yeah, definitely I think that it would be probably ideal to align it um, to what uh, the assessment guide um, requires. So that's what an assessor would use um, and um, it would definitely be worth to take a look at, at that alignment. The um, next question is, uh, does uh, the current regulation as in, in the form of the FAR, as on, also on the DFAR, um, does it provide for, uh, for uh, third party uh, assessments? That's a good question. Today we are not leveraging third party assessments. Um, we, it is not part of that DFAR clause or the FAR clause. So we do not look to see a third party assessment and we aren't, we don't, the, the rationale behind that is that our contract is within a, with a company and the company is the one who will be accountable and liable for it. So you can get a third party to do an assessment for you. It can give you a certificate or whatever else, but in the end, you're the one who's actually accountable. So we don't, we don't look for that in our um, engagement with industry. Okay, and what about assessments uh, done by third parties on behalf of the agency? There have not been any assessments done by a third party on behalf of the agencies. Okay. Um, the uh, next question would be, uh, what is the, in, in, in your mind, um, what is the role of, of Prime when it comes down to the enforcement of these requirements? Um, as you uh, may know, the uh, flow down right. really is just a matter of sharing uh, those requirements down to your you know, down to your chain, uh, your supply chain, um, do you actually see a more active role from primes uh, on the enforcement of these requirements? I would say there should be a very active role um, <clears throat> with the primes as they engage with their supply chain. Um, the latest uh, guidance from the acquisition community is for the defense contract management agency to actually look and at the in their contract team purchasing system reviews to look and see how the primes are actually flowing that information down. So yes, the primes have a definite role in that process and they need to make sure that the information associated with that contract, no matter where it goes in the supply chain, is being protected. Um, we have, uh, we know that some of our components have done some extensive research on this particularly uh, and have found that uh, the the primes would flow down the entire tech data package and it would go all the way down the supply chain. And at the end of the supply chain, it would be perhaps just the bolt maker and the bolt maker really didn't need that package. So those are things that we're actually looking at is make sure that you're only sharing the information that needs to be shared. And I would add on to that, the other strategy here is if you know your supplier or your subcontractor is not able to safeguard the information, look at an alternative way to share the information with them. Whether you go to the old fashioned way of printing it and putting it on paper and then telling them to lock it in a file cabinet at the end of the day, or perhaps you want to bring that sub subcontractor into your own facility where you can control the, the environment and the security of the environment. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? We have time for one more question. Yes, we have time for a couple more questions. No. Nope. No? Okay. Well, I, I leave the contact information up here. Um, you can send any requests that you have for follow-on information to the email address there. Um, our website for uh, 
our information sharing program is at dibnet.dod.mil. That is also the website where you would go to report a cyber incident. Um, again, if you're reporting a cyber incident, uh, you need to have a DOD approved medium assurance certificate um, in order to access the site. So welcome your feedback and your input and your questions, and I thank you for having me today um, very much.